Um, it's, it's my pleasure to be kicking things off, and I'd like to kick things off to start with, with a bit of audience participation. Could you, could you raise your hands for me if you're, you consider yourself pretty familiar with blockchain? Um, okay, that's quite a small number. I probably summarised would be about 20% of the audience. How many of you uh, p consider yourself pretty familiar with Bitcoin? Um, slightly more, but not terribly many more. Okay, that's, no, that's really good. So I won't ask you how many people have got a Bitcoin account. I certainly don't have one. Um, the, the interesting thing about blockchain, and, and very much we, we heard this in the introdu introduction, it's, it's very much currently overhyped, overstated, and often very confused topic. Um, and I, since I've been working in the blockchain area, which is just since about last September, um, we've been, within, within IBM, we've really been taking um, a, a position of trying to make it real for business, to add business clarity to the discussion and avo avoid technical gobbledygook, and really to focus on business networks and permissioned, closed and trusted business networks, which is, if you think about it, pretty diametrically opposite to the, uh, to the Bitcoin scenario. So my 10 minutes, I'm going to try and do it without hesitation, deviation or repetition, which is a bit of a joke if um, any of you are familiar with that one. And I'm going to be talking about, um, first of all, our points of view on blockchain from an IBM point of view. I'm going to be talking about the benefits that accrue for the use of blockchain within a business network and then end on three use cases, which I'll go through quickly. And again, sorry if I go through this, rattle through this. Um, we'll definitely be around and have more detailed discussions about this either at the end or, or uh, offline as needed. So to understand IBM's point of view, we actually have to look at how businesses work today and realising that um, businesses and governments never actually operate in isolation. They're all members of a business network. Um, and um, the ownership of assets move across that business network in, in, in return for payments governed by contracts. And the assets can either be tangible or they can be um, such as a house or a car or they could be intangible such as a bond or a piece of intellectual property or a piece of digital music. But essentially the way things operate today is each member of the um, business network keeps their own ledger so they all have a separate ledger which they update every time an asset moves into or out of their organisation. Um, and this has been, well, it's been around since about the 13th century. I think it was invented by some, some monk. Um, it's obviously well proven. Um, it's, however, it's pretty inefficient and it can be prone to fraud and often results on piling cost on cost, particularly when you start putting um, regulators or, and audit, auditors into the loop. So if we look at a world where, um, where blockchain gets involved, now the blockchain architectures, as we heard in the introduction, gives the opportunity for the participants to share a ledger, which is updated every time a transaction occurs automatically by peer-to-peer -peer replication. Now this is all very well, but clearly if we have in a business network, we need to bring, a, bring to bear privacy services which make sure that participants can only see the parts of the ledger that are relevant to them and no other parts, and also that all transactions that occur within the business network are secure, authenticated and verifiable. Um, our view of blockchain within a business network also includes the concept of a smart contract, uh, which is basically uh, the consequences of asset transfer, which are essentially encoded and executed automatically with the tra transaction in the, blo in the blockchain. Um, we also see that network participants must be able to agree the method of transaction validation and because it's a closed and trusted network, this can be completely different to what we've seen emerge through the, bit, the Bitcoin early examples. Um, now also, uh, government oversight, compliance and audit can also coexist in this business network, which actually makes those processes much more efficient and easier to implement. As I've mentioned earlier, um, blockchain is definitely very different from Bitcoin. Bitcoin's clearly a, been around for some time, and for those of you who are familiar, obviously will know that it's an anonymous cryptocurrency. The best way of looking at blockchain is it's the, like the underpinning plumbing. It's like the technology underneath Bitcoin. Or you could imagine that Bitcoin is like the first use case for blockchain. Uh, but we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're much more interested in applying this these days to business networks. So um, the... It, when we sort of apply blockchain like this, we move from a situation, as I mentioned earlier, that's inefficient, expensive, vulnerable, and prone to error, 
to one where um, all the transactions are agreed and validated uh, according to a method agreed by all the members of the business network. Um, they can't be messed with. Once a transaction is committed to the blockchain, there's a digital fingerprint of the previous block in the current block, which means that you can't go back and mess with the blockchain once the transactions are committed into it. Um, it's also final. It presents an agreed set of truth across the business network, so it eliminates things such as disputes on ownership or, an, on asset, or complexities in asset transfer. Uh, that's a, in, eliminated as a consequence of using blockchain. So the benefits that accrue are largely threefold. There's, first of all, this saves time of transactions. So transaction execution times can move from days to a matter of minutes or almost to real time. It can also reduce costs through taking out inefficiencies and making things like audit and regulation much more simple. And it can also reduce the risk of cybercrime or cyber fraud or, or malicious attack in the business network. So those are the key benefits from blockchain. As I mentioned, I wanted to end with um, three case studies, and I'm obviously going to rattle through these because of the uh, sake of time. And I've chosen, on, on purpose, non-financial case studies, um, because uh, clearly, they, interestingly, obviously the fin financial services sector is the early adopter of, these, uh, of the, the technology, without a doubt. But I think there are some really interesting use cases emerging in non-financial sector organisations. Let's start with supply chain or supply chain management. In, in short, you know, it's cutting, all the, cutting through that, it's basically knowing where your stuff is in the supply chain. So um, currently, members of the supply chain keep their own records about the assets as they transfer in and out of their organisation. Um, going all the way through from the creation of raw materials all the way through to the, uh, the consumer. This drives up cost, increases complexity, complexity and also gives you some regulatory headaches as you move forward. Now if we had a situation where um, the, every participant shared an agreed view of where the assets were across the supply chain and in terms of the location and their ownership, which was updated every time something changed, this would give you a much, much more efficient way of managing the supply chain. Uh, people would be sure where their stuff was. Um, the whole system would be resilient to error and fraud and, or, and, and indeed cyber attack. So supply chain is the first interesting one. The second one is, is provenance in systems of value. Now complex systems such as aircraft, it's really quite difficult to track all the different components in the systems of systems that could go to provide an aircraft. So when you need a manufacturing recall due to, to a problem occurring, it's usually quite broad, it's broad, you have to recall quite a large amount of the fleet. Uh, because it's so difficult to track these components uh, and build up this, this ch chain of provenance. However, if we actually apply, applied a blockchain um, to this use case, uh, we could actually make sure that all the, all the um, components of the complex system were recorded on the blockchain and their, uh, their change of ownership or movement through the systems recorded as things change over time which could give much more efficient recalls and recalls much more down to individual subsystems and components. Um, I mentioned aircraft, but such prominent systems would also be applicable to things like high value, high value art or jewellery or diamonds and things like that. Um, the final use case that I'd like to go through is... Uh, <laughs> good evening, Fred, this year. I, I got started, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Um, the final use case that uh, I'd like to go through is, is asset management. Now, asset management is a really interesting topic, and it started sometime in the 80s when there were problems with big things like oil rigs and stuff like that. And organisations realised that they needed multidisciplinary, um, non-co-located teams to efficiently manage complex assets, such as an oil rig or a ship or an aircraft. Um, and um, the... The blockchain would basically give the capability of sharing all the, the characteristics of the, of the complex asset uh, through all the different members of, member teams that are required to maintain that asset through its life cycle. Also, this is where smart contracts could come in, and that the, the, the smart contracts within the um, asset management blockchain could pre-encode and execute the conditions required to move the, um, the asset through its different stages in its life cycle. Now, how does this result? It basically results in an improved risk posture for those people managing the asset. They can be much more sure of the information relating to the asset, hence, take, hence be more aggressive in their risk management techniques. And also, as I mentioned in the other uh, use cases, it could reduce, reduce costs and improve reg regulatory oversight in the business network. So those are the three use cases. I'd just like to end with a few closing re remarks, if I may. Um, 
we actually see open standards, open source and open governments, governance being very, very important in blockchain fabrics. And that's why we were a founder member and major code contributor uh, to the Linux Foundation project, the Hyperledger project that was announced just before Christmas. Uh, we see interoperability being blo between blockchains as being key as we move forward. And again, that's why open standards comes in. The other thing to, to say about it is it's technology at its very earliest stage for gestation. It's really, really new stuff. Um, be very, very sceptical about if people tell you they've got a blockchain system going into production anytime soon. Mm -hmm. 2016, without a doubt, is going to be the year of the pilot. It's going to be when people do first projects, when they do business evaluations of the benefit of the blockchain to learn about it, to move things forward. Um, so I think that's, that's where we are right now. I th also think that cloud systems actually lend themselves very much, very nicely to rapid prototyping, and that's why we've put early releases of the Hyperledger code into um, our Bluemix cloud platform, which people can just go in and play with, essentially. Now, we're, we're without a doubt that, that blockchain will transform business and government over time. Um, we spend a lot of time advising customers how to take the first steps towards that, those, uh, those transformations. But I think it will also help government and business work much more closely together in the future. But we very, very strongly feel that now's the time for educating oneself about blockchain, gaining awareness, piloting projects, more baby step projects, and the time's not right for regulation yet. So this, uh, right now, it's all about learning and moving forward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, those, those are my remarks. Very interested in taking any questions that you've got later. Thank you very much.